But for now, I'm really excited to introduce Flossie from the Maldivian Manta Ray Project, who is, which is a Manta Trust project. Um, she's going to tell us all about Manta Rays. She's the current um, education and outreach manager for the project. And so she's got lots to tell us. And I'm really excited. So uh, warm welcome, Flossie. The floor is all yours. Okay, hi guys. Um, thanks for having me, Sharks for Kids. And um, I think it's great that you're doing these webinars. Um, all right, I'll just share my screen and get started. All right, that's all good? Perfect. Yep. Okay, um, so today, as Jenny said, I'm going to tell you a little bit about manta rays. Um, a little bit different from sharks, but these are some really cool animals. Um, here's a photo of me amongst lots of animals, lots of manta rays in one of my favourite places in the world. So this is called Hanifaru Bay, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this during the presentation. Um, but it's a really special place where we get tons of mantas coming together to feed. So just a bit of background on how I ended up um, working with mantas. Um, I grew up in the UK. I did a few different things before I decided I wanted to go into marine conservation. Um, I started with a fashion degree, realized that wasn't for me, um, and went into education studies before finally going into uh, marine management. So I did my master's in marine management um, and I did my research placement with the Maldivian Manta Ray Project. Um, and I now head up all of the uh, education programs where we take lots of local students um, snorkeling and teach them about the ocean. But I also spend half of my time um, working with the manta rays and doing the manta research. So that's what I'm going to focus on today and tell you all about today. Okay, so where is the Maldives? It is a little chain of islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean, um, close to India, which is here, and Sri Lanka. Um, and it's a chain of 26 atolls. So an atoll is basically um, an extinct volcano that was in the area millions of years ago. Um, and had coral start to grow all the way around the extinct volcano rim um, or crater rim. And that coral kept growing as the sea level rose um, and it formed all of these beautiful atolls and islands that we have today. So we have 26 of these in the Maldives um, and I am based in one in the north. This is called Bar Atoll um, and I'm in this little eastern corner of Bar Atoll. So this tiny little pocket of the world um, where we get huge aggregations of mantas. All right, so I work for the Maldivian Manta Ray Project. Um, this is a manta research charity that was started in 2005 when our founder, who's called Guy Stevens, um, was living in the Maldives and realized there was tons of manta rays here and they needed to be um, research, we needed to better understand them, and we needed to know if they were threatened or if they needed protection. In 2011, um, we made the Manta Trust, which is a UK registered charity, and it encompasses the Maldivian Manta Ray Project, but lots of other projects all over the world that research manta rays. So we can basically see mantas all over the world in the tropical and subtropical seas. So in this band in the middle of the world, um, so in the warmer oceans. So there's lots of projects that are researching mantas all over the world. So what are manta rays? Um, they are actually in the same group as sharks. So this group is called the cartilaginous elasmobranch fish. And these are very long and sciencey words. Um, so I'm gonna break them down a little bit for you. Cartilaginous means that the manta rays and the sharks, um, skeletons, are made of cartilage and not bone. So cartilage is the same material that our ears, if you touch your ears and you touch your nose, it's the same material that our ears and nose are made of. So you can feel that they're a little bit more flexible than the rest of your body. And this means that manta rays and sharks and skates and all other rays can move through the water a little bit more efficiently than other bony fish. 
Elasmobranch means metal plate gills. So all of these animals here have between five and seven gill slits on either side of their body. Um, and these gills are used to breathe. So they can actually extract oxygen from the water using their gills. Um, and this is one of the reasons that they are fish. So they do not need to come to the surface of the water to breathe like a whale or a dolphin does, which are mammals, um, but mantas and their cousins actually can extract oxygen from the water whilst they're swimming. Um, so they're a pretty cool group of animals. Now we have two types of manta rays. Um, we mostly see the reef manta ray in the Maldives, um, but there is also the oceanic manta ray. Now I want you to have a look and see if you can spot any differences between the two. Um, one of the main differences is their size. So this is something you can't really see from the pictures, but the reef mantas are actually smaller than the oceanic mantas, or sometimes they're called the giant mantas. So the reef mantas can get to be about four meters from one wingtip to the other wingtip. So they're absolutely huge. So that's about 12 feet um, for anyone who doesn't do meters. Um, so if you stretch out your arms, that's about at least two of those um, arm spans. That's the size of the reef manta ray. Now they don't have any stinging barbs on their tail, so they can't actually hurt you. So we call them gentle giants. They're huge, but they're not dangerous. The oceanic manta can actually get even bigger. So the oceanic can get to seven meters from one wingtip to the other wingtip. So that's about 21 feet, so absolutely huge. Now, some of you might have spotted some other differences while I've been talking. One of these is the coloration on top of the manta. So the reef manta has more of a Y-shaped pattern on the top of its body, whilst the oceanic has this very distinct T-shaped pattern that you can see here. Another difference is their spots on their bellies. So the reef mantas usually have spots between their gills at the top of their bodies, whilst the oceanic mantas mostly have spots on their lower bellies. And this is some of the ways that we identify what type of manta ray we're seeing when we're in the water with them. In the Maldives, we mostly see the reef manta. We have to be very lucky to see an oceanic manta. Okay, so one of the coolest things about mantas is that they all have a different pattern of spots on their bellies. And this pattern of spots means that we can tell different individual manta rays apart. So this is just like human beings having a unique fingerprint pattern. Mantas have this unique spot pattern. You can see on the left here, we have a manta with only three spots. And as we go along, we can see mantas with more and less spots. So you can see that they are different manta rays. And these spots will not change over the whole duration of the manta's life. So this is something that we can use to research and understand mantas. We can basically go out, find some mantas, take pictures of their belly spots, and compare them to a huge database that we have of all of the mantas we've ever seen in the Maldives and all of their spot patterns. So every single manta that we see, <clears throat> has a different spot pattern, a different name that's given to it, a code number, and we can also write down things like its gender, so if it's a male or a female manta, and if it has any injuries, or if it looks like it's pregnant. This big picture here is our spottiest manta in the whole of the Maldives. Um, it is a male manta, so have a think what its name might be. So it's a male manta, very spotty. So its name is actually Mr. Spotty. And Mr. Spotty is a very friendly manta. Um, we see him quite often and we all recognize him and know him quite well. Um, so I'm gonna show you a couple more clips of Mr. Spotty throughout this presentation. So mantas have these huge mouths um, and you might think that they would feed on something big, like big fish. But actually, they feed on some of the smallest animals in the ocean. And these are called zooplankton. So they're tiny little animals that drift around in the water column. Now, 
what the mantas do is they swim along with their mouths open and their cephalic fins unrolled. So these fins at the top of their heads are called cephalic fins and they unroll them when they want to feed so that they can funnel lots of water and plankton into their mouths. So this is actually Mr. Spotty swimming past us now. Um, and Mr. Spotty, you can see, is feeding on all these tiny little dots in the water. Um, and these are little bits of plankton. Now this manta is called Baba Ganoush, and he is one of our favorite mantas too. And if we pause this, you can see all these little blue bits on its belly are called copepods, and this is this type of plankton. So they're absolutely tiny. Um, you can just about see them with the human eye and the mantas have to eat loads of them every day just to keep the energy that they need to stay alive. Now what they do is they swim forward and get that water to come into their big mouths and any bits of plankton get stuck on their gill rakers which are these black bits inside their mouths and these act as sieves so they are pieces of very fine filament that trap the plankton and let the water push through. So the manta can digest the plankton whilst the water will flush out of the manta's gills. It's a pretty cool feeding method. And we call this somersault feeding, which is what Baba Ganoush is doing. So he's doing backwards somersault feeding to get loads and loads of plankton into his mouth at one time. Now there's one really special place where lots of mantas come together to feed at certain times of year. And this is called Honey Furrow Bay. Now Hanifaro Bay is a biosphere reserve and that means it's a protected area. So that means that there's special rules in place to protect the manta rays and the other animals here. It is located in Bar Atoll, which is where I am based. Um, and it's this tiny, tiny bay um, where we have this shallow outer reef on the outside. So all of that light blue on that picture a shallow reef about one or two meters deep or a few feet deep um, and inside we have this darker blue area that gets to about 15 meters or 45 feet deep um, and that traps the plankton. So what happens is the water is pulled in by the current at certain times of the year, pulled this direction and it pulls all of that yummy plankton with it. Um, and that plankton gets trapped by this shallow reef on the outside and it gets concentrated and more and more plankton comes in and then the mantas come to feed on all of that delicious plankton. Okay. So this is a video showing some different clips from Hanifaro Bay. Here we can see the shallow reef on the outside of the bay um, and inside you can see the deeper bowl where the plankton gets stuck and the manta rays come to feed. Now we have had a maximum of about 250 different manta rays inside this area on one day. So how do we know this? Well, we have to take pictures of all of their bellies or as many as we can and compare them all to see how many different bellies we have seen. And this can take a long time and a lot of practice at freediving in the right way. Now you can see here, some of the water is murky with lots of plankton. Um, and if you have really keen eyes, you might see that this manta swimming past now is actually not a reef manta ray. So this is an oceanic manta. It's one of the giant mantas and we don't see it very often at all in here. So this was a very special sighting. Now here the mantas are doing something called surface feeding. And this is when the plankton is stuck at the top of the water and the mantas open their big mouths and engulf all of that plankton at the top of the water. Sometimes we get a lucky visit from a big spotty friend. So this is a whale shark. Whale sharks actually feed on very similar things to manta rays. Um, they feed on plankton. So sometimes we see them inside a honey furrow when we're really, really lucky. And they sometimes feed with the manta rays, which is really, really cool. When we see a whale shark, we try and take a picture of this area behind its gills and above its pectoral fin. Um, because this is unique to every whale shark, it has a different pattern of spots, just like the manta rays, 
and we send that to the research group um, to identify that whale shark. Here you can see two groups of mantas doing something called cyclone feeding. So this is when the mantas will all group together and they'll swim into a circle and they'll make a current with all of their bodies. And that current will pull the yummy plankton into the middle so they can feast on loads and loads of it at one time. So they do use some really cool teamwork strategies while they're feeding. And here you can see the end of the bay. Um, so this is where um, the boats are allowed to moor. I mentioned that there are some restrictions that we have to follow in Hanifaro which protect the manta rays. One of these is that there's not more than five boats allowed in the bay at one time. Um, not more than 80 snorkelers, there's no scuba diving allowed, and we have some rangers which come and make sure that everybody is, is following the rules. So this is their ranger boat here, um, and this helps to keep the mantas safe in this really important area for them to feed. So when the mantas aren't feeding, they need to get clean. Um, so mantas get dirty and they don't have hands like us to clean their bodies. So they have to rely on something else. And that something else is what we call cleaner fish. So these are little cleaner wrasse and this is a moon wrasse. And these fish um, eat the dirt of other animals, big animals like manta rays, sharks, turtles and other fish. So they live on a piece of coral reef the manta ray was, will visit that coral reef and the little cleaner fish will swim upwards to the manta ray's body and they'll swim into its gills, into its mouth even, all over its body and they will pick all of the dirt off of that manta ray. So that might be bits of food scraps, um, bits of dead skin or little parasites which live on the manta ray and feed off the manta ray. So the manta ray is never going to swallow these cleaner fish. Um, they have what we call a symbiotic relationship. And this is the relationship between two animals where both animals get something good from it. So the manta rays get nice and clean and they won't get any diseases or infections and the cleaner fish get a big meal. So this is what we call a symbiotic relationship. And sometimes we call the manta spa. Now, unfortunately, like most animals in the world, manta rays are threatened by humans. Um, one of the big threats from humans is fishing nets and fishing lines. So humans all over the world put out a lot of big nets, which we call gill nets um, and some other types of nets and lines to catch smaller fish like tuna um, and other fish that we eat. Unfortunately, these nets um, don't decide what they want to catch. Um, and if a manta ray swims into a net, it will get stuck in that net and it won't be able to breathe. Manta rays have to keep swimming forward in order to breathe and get oxygen from the water. So if they get stuck in a fishing net, they're going to get trapped and they might even drown. So this is one of the big threats to mantas. Sadly, there is an even bigger threat and that is the threat of fishing. So some countries do fish manta rays um, directly and they fish them to sell their gill plates. So these are their gill rakers. These are what are inside their gills and what they use to filter plankton from the water. And some countries believe that if you eat their gill rakers in a soup, which doesn't look very tasty to me, then you will get healthier and stronger. Now there's, this is not true at all. There's no scientific evidence that says this is true. Um, and it is causing manta ray populations to decrease very fast. So their numbers are dropping in a lot of countries. Now, Luckily, some countries are seeing that manta rays are worth more alive than dead. So it's much better to keep them alive where they'll be healthy and where lots of tourists can go and swim with them, which will make a country money than to kill them for food. Um, and not even for um, food like fish, but for a, a sort of medicine or a remedy. So the Maldives was one of these countries and luckily mantas were added to the protected species list in 2014, which means that nobody is allowed to fish or harm manta rays. 
There's also an international convention um, which says that a lot of countries that have signed this convention um, are not allowed to buy or sell manta ray products. And this is in hope that we can stop the flow of gill rakers to countries that like to eat them. Um, so there are some good protection measures being put in place for manta rays, but there's a long way to come. Okay, so I've told you a bit about manta biology. Now I'm going to tell you a bit about what we do in the Maldives to research and better understand manta rays. Now what we do in Bar Atoll is every day during the manta season, we go out on our research boat. So this is this picture in the bottom left corner. Um, this is what we call a dhoni. It's a type of Maldivian boat and we love our dhoni. We go out on it almost every day and we stand on the top of the dhoni and we scan the water for mantas. So we look for their big black shapes in the water. We check lots of different sites. So we check sites where they might be feeding and sites where they might be cleaning. We also write down a lot of information. So some of the information we write down will be what the weather conditions are or what the current strength is or how much food is in the water. But we might also write down how many humans are in the area, how many snorkelers um, and how many boats. And all of this information over time will tell us what mantas are doing, which areas they're visiting and how they might be threatened. Now, once we see mantas, we dive underneath them and we hold our breaths and we take pictures of their bellies. So like this guy is doing in the top right corner, um, we want to get a good shot that shows their spot pattern between the gills and also shows whether they're male or female. And these photos are gonna tell us which mantas are in which areas when and what they're doing. And this helps us better understand and eventually better protect manta rays. So what have we found out from this information? We've been doing this for about 15 years in the Maldives. So we found out lots of cool stuff. Um, and one of the coolest things is that we have the biggest population of reef manta rays in the whole world in the Maldives. So that's almost 5,000 individuals that we've taken pictures of. And every single one has a different pattern of spots on its belly and a different name. And we record different information about it. Now, most of these mantas aren't very adventurous. They're usually seen throughout their life in the same atoll in which they were first seen. But some mantas get to be a bit more adventurous. So there's one manta called Pawpaw that actually visited five different atolls and was seen in five different atolls. And somebody took a picture of her belly. So if there's anyone adventurous watching, then Pawpaw is a little bit like you. Another manta that made a really cool journey is called Ewok. Now Ewok was one of the manta researchers' favorite mantas a few years ago. Um, she was always recognized. They always knew her belly spots. And she used to always hang around in Bar Atoll. Now one year she didn't show up in Bar Atoll. So the researchers were a bit concerned. They, they wondered where she was. Next year she didn't show up again. And finally, we received, we received a picture from a dive center in Adu Atoll, which is in the far south of the Maldives. So it's 700 kilometers from Bar Atoll. Um, and I think you can guess who the picture was of. It was of Ewok. So Ewok had traveled 700 kilometers and she was even pregnant. So we think that Ewok actually found love and moved to the south. So this is some of the really cool information we can find out from photo identification. Now, something else we can find out that's really useful is a bit more information about how mantas give birth, how often they get pregnant and how they reproduce. So from our um, data, from all the pictures we've collected over the years, we can now understand that mantas only have one baby or one pup every five to seven years in the Maldives. And this means that they're, really, that they're really vulnerable animals. So if we start to fish manta rays, then their numbers will decline really fast because they can't have babies fast enough to replace those that are being fished. Now, the mantas will be pregnant for over a year. So it's usually 12 and a half months that they carry this one baby in their bellies. 
And we can tell when they're pregnant in the later stages of pregnancy because they have this really fat bulge at the back of them. So the baby manta is huge. Um, it's about one and a half meters when it's born. So that's four and a half feet. So if you stretch out your arms again, the baby manta is about that big when it's born. So it's absolutely huge. And when it's in its mum, it has its wings rolled up behind its back, just like a little burrito or a huge burrito. Um, and that's why the mum manta looks so big and fat. Um, so we love to see all these pregnant mantas. And that pup is gonna be independent from birth. So that means that it's not gonna hang around with its mum. It's actually gonna have to fend for itself um, as soon as it's born. And that's why it needs to be so big. Now, sometimes we see juvenile mantas or young mantas, and they can be very shy and scared of us. And sometimes we see them and they're very curious. So this is a manta that we saw a um, couple of years ago, and I was very curious. So this is one of my favorite encounters with a manta ray. Um, mantas usually swim on their front, but when they're feeling curious or sometimes threatened, they will flip over onto their back um, and they will look at you a bit closer up and check you out. So this one swam around us for about five minutes, just checking us out and maybe trying to see what we were. Now, we wanted to find out a bit more about manta reproduction. Um, and along with all these partners, we developed an underwater ultrasound machine. And that helps us to understand how mantas reproduce, what the signs of mantas being old enough to have babies are inside the manta ray's bodies, um, and what the pregnancy looks like um, inside the body. So you can see here, we're just scanning that manta ray. We don't touch the manta ray, we hold the ultrasound away from the skin, um, and we can see inside the body of the manta ray and get some really useful information. So this is a really cool experience to scan these manta rays. Okay, and one of the cool um, bits of information that we got from this was about blob. So this is blob. Um, you can see in the top right picture, blob has a bit of a funny left cephalic fin. So that's the head fin, remember? So blob has an injured, cephalic fin on the left and it sticks out at a funny angle. So we always know when we see Blob because she has her funny head fin. Now we saw Blob last year at a cleaning station um, and we decided to scan her. And we didn't think she was pregnant because she had a very flat back. She didn't have that big round fat belly that mantas have when they're visibly pregnant. We scanned her and we sent our scans to our colleague, her scans to our colleague, and it turned out she was pregnant. So these are some of the scans and you can actually see the fetus in these scans. So Blob had a little pup inside of her and the ultrasound showed the earlier stages of pregnancy that we couldn't see with our eyes. Another way that we research mantas other than taking pictures um, is by spying on them with video cameras. Um, so it's really important for us to know what the mantas are doing when humans aren't in the water. Because sometimes mantas might act differently when humans are around. So what we do is we put a camera which is attached to a weight underwater on a cleaning station and we film what the mantas are doing. Now we leave that camera down on a piece of rock for about four hours. We go to some other places to look for mantas. We come back four hours later, pick up the camera, and then we download the video footage when we're back at our office with our computers. We watch the video footage, so I'll just show you here. And sometimes we're lucky and we get mantas. So if we get mantas, we look at them and we try and see um, which mantas they are. We can tell by their spot patterns. Um, how many mantas we can see, how long they stay at the cleaning station, any interesting behavior. This one is actually pooping. Um, and 
um, yeah, how they're using the cleaning station. And we can use this information over time to understand why and how manta rays use cleaning stations. Now, some of you might recognize this manta ray. He's very spotty. This is actually Mr. Spotty. And in this clip, he's probably got a little bit annoyed by a cleaner fish just biting on him. And he's done a little backflip to shake that cleaner fish off. And sometimes we see other animals. So this is a gray reef shark that swam over our cleaning station. Sometimes we see turtles as well, which is pretty cool. So we wanted to actually increase the amount of time that we could spy on these manta rays and see what they were doing at cleaning stations. So one of my colleagues made this system called the Eyes on the Reef. This is basically a GoPro camera inside a pipe and that pipe is airtight so none of the water can get in and it has lots of battery packs attached to it so the battery can last for ages. Now we put this down next to a cleaning station um, and it will take a picture every minute of the day um, for usually around 14 days. So about two weeks, it will take a picture every minute that's got daylight. So we might have about 10,000 pictures by the time we pull it up. And this is gonna tell us how the manta rays use the cleaning stations at different times of year and at different times of the day, which is really important information to understand the manta rays better. Sometimes we get some funny visitors. So this is actually a stingray swimming past our eyes on the reef. Here we have a green sea turtle that looks like he's having a look at the eyes on the reef or maybe just having a rest um, on the sand. A plastic bag. Unfortunately, the Maldives is not immune to the world's plastic problem. We do see a lot of plastic in the water. And there's me as well. So we have to check on the system and check that it's still working every day. So sometimes we get some funny pictures of us checking out the system underwater. Now we do get lucky as well with lots of pictures of manta rays. So up in the top corner, we have a manta called Anne. Um, and if we can see the manta rays bellies, we're gonna work out who they are. Um, if not, we're gonna count the amount of mantas that are using the cleaning station at different times of day. Um, so this can give us some really in, interesting information about the mantas. So how can you help mantas and help the ocean and their habitat that they live in, which is closely linked to the coral reefs? You can help fight climate breakdown. So there's a lot of climate change going on, the oceans are warming, and every single person needs to do their bit to help. So you can do this by um, using less electricity, using less water, um, using public transport instead of a car or telling your family to do the same, um, or even by changing your diet, you can start to eat less meat um, and more sustainable foods. You can try and eat sustainable seafood. So these apps that are um, on the screen here in this website, um, we'll show you some sustainable seafood guides. Basically, that's going to tell you if the fish that you're eating is safe for manta rays, um, for dolphins, and for other animals. So usually sustainable seafood has been caught using a pole and a line and not a big net that can injure lots of other animals. So you can change your diet and eat sustainable seafood. You can spread the word. So tell your friends and your family all about manta rays, about the oceans, about coral reefs, and about all the threats that they are facing. Tell them about eating sustainable seafood and reducing their carbon footprint, and you can make a difference. And if you see a manta ray, or if you know anyone who's going to swim with manta rays in the future, you can tell them to take pictures and send us the pictures on this website called ID the Manta. Um, if they send us their pictures, we can use these pictures to help us with our research and help us understand and maybe protect manta rays better. And if you take a picture of a manta that has never been seen before, then you can name that manta ray as well. All right, guys, so before I go, I'll just tell you a bit about some of the things that we're doing during this time. 
Um, we have set up a Manta Trust Kids Club with loads of resources where you can learn about manta rays, um, do lots of ocean themed activities as well. Um, so you can check out our Kids Club on that website there. You can adopt a manta ray um, to be your own manta, including Mr. Spotty or Baba Ganoush, who was in the feeding video. Um, and if you adopt a manta, you'll get an activity pack and a certificate and any funds raised will go towards manta conservation and research. And if you're a really keen young scientist or manta lover, you can join the Cyclone. This is a members only hub where we share all of our latest research um, and lots of interesting stories from the field for our members. You can follow us on social media um, at Manta Trust for loads of interesting videos, stories and manta pictures as well. Okay, thanks very much for listening and I'm looking forward to having some fantastic questions. Okay. All right, thank you so much for that Flossie, that was great. Um, really interesting and we've got some great questions coming through. Um, I am going to start with one that is uh, one that we usually ask to other people and usually it's around sharks but in this case I guess um, what is your favorite elasma brank and is it oh i think i'm biased <laughs> i think it might have to be the manta ray um but i don't know which one because i love reef mantas but i've had some amazing experiences with oceanic mantas that have been very curious and come and had a look at me in the water as well um so one or the other i think and, and speaking say. of the two has there ever been ex um examples have we ever observed whether uh, the oceanic and the reef have ever created hybrids between them? There is a potential third species that's being debated amongst scientists um, which would be called the Caribbean manta ray. Um, it lives in the Caribbean Sea and it seems to have traits from both the oceanic and the reef manta ray. Um, I don't know a lot about it but I think going back in time there is possibility that it is a hybrid species um, but it hasn't been sort of genetically um, distinguished yet um, but yeah it's very cool to know that there might be a third species yeah and and it wasn't it isn't it a debate as well that manta rays and mobular rays are actually in the same family yes they are so there's actually eight species of what we would call a devil ray um, and then the two known species of manta ray so 10 species in total um, the mob, well, manta rays are mobular rays, but we call them commonly the manta rays. Um, and then the mobular rays we'd call more commonly the devil rays. So they're just a smaller species um, that looks quite similar to a manta, but is usually a bit smaller and usually a bit more shy as well. So they're not, um, they don't sort of come into reefs or come close to divers as much. So we know a lot less about mobular rays. Great. Um... All right, so we had some questions about, um, someone asked about the, the feeding habits that you were mentioning. Could you uh, go back over them a little bit? They, I think they missed, they must have missed the free feeding habits and what they were. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you want me to just show some video again? Um, oh. oh, I don't think it's going to work. Ah, here we go. Oh, it's stopped. Oh, well, anyway, I'll just talk about them. Um, we have some feeding strategies that mantas do on their own. So we've got somersault feeding, which is when the mantas will do backward somersaults. And they usually do this when there's really dense patches of plankton and they want to get as much of it into their mouths as possible at one time. So they somersault backwards rather than swimming in a line and turning around um, because that would use more energy. Um, there's also some team feeding um, habits, so you can use uh, chain feeding where the mantis swim in a chain and the front of the chain, um, any food that the mantis at the front of the chain don't get will be pushed back and more concentrated for the mantis at the back of the chain. And then there's the really cool cyclone feeding, which is quite rare to see. Um, and that usually involves probably 50 mantas or more. Um, and the mantas will actually all together swim in a big circle. Um, and that, that sort of 
um, movement of their bodies together creates a current which will pull the water and pull all of that plankton in the water into the middle of the cyclone or the middle of the circle and that's going to concentrate that plankton so the mantas can then all eat the plankton so they work together to get a lot more food basically. Fantastic and, and speaking of teamwork um, you talked a little bit about how you sometimes spot um, whale sharks uh, and how they, they come in. And we saw in one of your photos that they were quite close to manta rays. Do they ever work yeah. together? I've never seen them work together to feed. Um, they do feed in very close proximity as far as I've seen. Um, sometimes the mantas get a bit scared of the whale shark, which is quite funny to see. So it does seem like very cool when it swims through and the mantas will kind of part to let the whale shark through. Um, but I've never witnessed teamwork feeding between the two. Um, I don't know if anyone else has. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, okay. Uh... Marine asks, how did you fall in love with manta rays? It's impossible not to once you meet them. Um, so I started working with manta rays um, during a research placement with my, for my master's project. Um, and just spending so much time in the water with them and seeing them in different, um, doing different behaviors, feeding, cleaning, courtship, um, being curious and being shy, um, you just start to understand that they may all have different sort of personalities. Um, they, every experience with them is different. Sometimes um, there's one manta and you could stay with that manta forever. Sometimes there's 50 and it's like overwhelming and very cool. So uh, yeah, you just can't not fall in love with mantas, I guess. Um, and um, so, we, we've been asked, um, do they, when they come together and feed in groups, do they stay in groups? Do, are they social all the time or do they all go off and, and part ways? That's a really good question. Um, there's not been much evidence, histor have evidence historically that manta rays are social creatures. So usually when we see them, they're on their own um, and they don't hang out in groups like dolphins or whales might do. They don't hang out in a pod, um, but they do come together to feed um, because they'll all get more of a benefit if they work together to feed. Um, and they do sometimes come together on cleaning stations and then they come together to mate. And there is a recent um, piece of research by the MMF that showed that they may actually also form some kind of social groups with different um, male and female groupings, um, but basically we need to do more research into this but they won't hang out in a distinct pod like um dolphins or whales well great um and you talked a little bit about the threats um to manta rays um what how is their pop what's their pop how is it doing how are their populations doing so in most places in the world um, manta ray populations seem to be declining and um, there's a lot of fisheries there are countries that have protected mantas like Indonesia that are struggling to um, regulate that protection. So they're such huge countries that they can't control if there's some illegal fishing or if there's still some fishing happening. Um, in countries where mantas have been protected, they're doing a bit better. So in the Maldives, the population is growing, um, but in most other places in the world, um, from the evidence that we have, the populations are um, decreasing in the reef manta rays. Okay. Um, when did the um, Manta Trust start recording manta sightings and, and IDing them? So in the Maldives, we started in 2005, um, but we actually have some records that go uh, past that, so from the 1990s and other dates like that. Um, but these records are records that have been sent to us by divers, by tourists, by marine biologists um, that have seen mantas before the Maldivian Manta Ray project started. So this is called citizen science and it's when people like um, anyone watching in the audience who isn't a researcher sees an animal and they send a picture to scientists to help them with their work. Um, so we started officially collecting data in 2005, but we do have some sightings before then. Um, and after 2005, the Maldivian Manta Ray project sort of grew into the Manta Trust and started um, working with affiliate projects all over the world. 
Fantastic. And speaking of citizen science, do you find that it's mostly tourists that provide um, these um, the, the, this information or do locals also get involved? It's a bit of a mix. A lot of the people that provide the information are the marine biologists or dive centre um, dive instructors that work at resorts or hotels or guest houses. Um, we do have more and more local people that are submitting information, but again, usually these people are um, working at dive centers, so they're not just individuals, um, but we do have tourists that submit their data every year they come to the Maldives as well. Um, but the more consistent information, the photos and even spreadsheet entries where they tell us about different conditions when they saw the manta rays are more from the dive instructors and marine biologists. And, and speaking of locals, I know that um, what part of your job is going out and, and interacting with the local communities. Can you tell us a little bit more about your work there? Yeah, so um, that's actually a big part of my job. Basically, we run a marine education program um, it's called Mudu Madarusa in the Maldivian language, but this translates to ocean school. Um, and every six months or so, we'll work with a different um, local island school with about between about 20 to 50 kids at a time. And we work with them um, every week. We go in and we talk about the ocean, not just manta rays, it's everything from coral reefs to mangroves to climate change. Um, and we do a lot of snorkeling. So it's very active and um, we want to get the kids in the water and witnessing the beautiful reefs around them <clears throat> and their beautiful environment because a lot of these students don't get much opportunities to go in the water. Um, so one of the most important ways to conserve animals is to make people love them and understand them. So this is what we're trying to um, increase with our marine education program. Fantastic. And, um, Coming back to the mantas, do you, besides humans, do they have any predators? They do. I was actually going to talk about this, but I thought it was getting a bit long. Um, but they do have sharks, some species of really big sharks that will predate on them. Um, sharks like bull sharks, tiger sharks, um, hammerhead sharks, and even orcas um, or killer whales. We don't see many killer whales in the Maldives, but about once a year you do hear that they've been sighted um, and these will bite the manta rays if they can. I think it's around 20% of our population in the Maldives has signs of being bitten by a shark. Now luckily the shark will usually bite the back of the manta's body um, on the wings and if it bites the back of the wings um, then that skin actually has the ability to regenerate so the mantas can regenerate that tissue and the wound can heal quite well um, so it's only if the shark bites the manta where it has its vital organs or if it gets infected that it might cause the manta to die but usually they can actually heal quite well from these shark bites. Fantastic. Uh, inter really interesting. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that there were killer whales out in the Maldives. <laughs> yeah, very rarely. I've never seen one. It's usually just one sighting every year and you're like, wow, I wish I was there. Yeah. Um, which of all the manta rays is your favourite? Oh, there's a few, but there's one called Turtle, um, funny name for a manta, I know, um, that we used to see all the time and she's a huge female. Um, and she's very bolshy and confident and she usually comes up and barrel rolls or somersault feeds right in front of your face and you have to kind of get out the way. Um, we didn't see her last year, so we were wondering where she's been, um, but she's one of my favourites for sure. Okay, I'll finish with a, just a couple of questions. The, the first one is, you talked about the, my, the, how they move around the Maldives mm -hmm. and uh, I, we were wondering, do you have it, has there ever been sightings in a different country? Do they ever leave the Maldives? Not that we know of. So from all of our data, the mantas don't leave the Maldives. The reef mantas don't leave the Maldives. So we've never had a sighting in another country. But the Maldives is quite separated from most other countries. So they don't really see reef mantas in India or Sri Lanka. Um, usually the mantas seen there are the oceanic mantas, the bigger mantas, and they're usually only seen when they're caught in fishing nets. So we do get oceanic mantas coming through the Maldives and 
they could be the same oceanic mantas that are being caught in the Sri Lankan fishing nets. And this is something we're actually um, expanding our research on and trying to figure out at the moment because we're not sure if these oceanic mantas move outside of the Maldives waters or if they stay inside of the Maldives um, the whole time. But the reef mantas, we don't think so. Okay. All right, and the last question I have is, a lot of the people watching, um, apologies for the dog in the background, but um, <laughs> a lot of the people watching and the children and the young people watching are interested in pursuing a career in marine biology or marine conservation. Um, what is yeah. your advice for them? Never give up. Um, there's so many people in this industry that will say it's so hard to get a job and um, it's impossible to enter this field. And I changed my um, course quite a few times. So I started in something very random and I ended up in marine biology. And so I thought I had up absolutely no chance of getting into this field um, and a lot of people told me that but if you persevere then you do have a chance you've got to be willing to make contacts wherever you go to talk to people um, to make connections and to take any opportunities you get for internships work hard so that you can pay to go out to a different country fly yourself out to do an internship it's really hard but eventually you will get there um, if you work hard basically and keep trying and don't get, dis don't get um, disencouraged. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And thank you for taking the time to give us the presentation and talk to us and answer all of our questions. We really appreciate it. Um, do you have any social media that people can follow you at? Um, Manta Trust, we've got at Manta Trust. Um, and then my personal one would be at Underwater Flow. Um, that you can follow um, both of them for loads of mantas, basically. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, and again, if anyone has any more questions about sharks or rays, Elasma Branks in general, um, or if you want to know when the next webinars are, feel free to visit our website, sharksforkids.com. There's also plenty of crafts and fact sheets, and we're constantly working on the content on the website. So if you have any ideas or requests, just drop us a line on our social media or on the emails that you'll find on the website. Thank you so much for watching and thank you Flossie for uh, joining us. We will see you later for another webinar. Thanks guys. Bye.